Going into the last round of the 2015 British Chess Championship, four players had seven and a half points in the lead, and they all had to play against the chasing pack. This meant excitement guaranteed. Here is the only decisive game from the top four boards. Hello everyone, this is Andrew Martin and welcome to my final game of the day from Warwick 2015, the British Chess Championships. And we're going to focus on the game between Grandmasters Jonathan Hawkins playing white and Keith Arkell playing with black. Well, Hawkins is becoming more and more difficult to prepare for as he strikes, he can strike with either e4 or d4 according to his opponent. And here he decides to challenge Keith with one e4. Will it be the French today? Will it be c6? Some sort of white squared strategy? Keith decides to play the Sicilian defence. And a very brave choice against Hawkins. Hawkins doesn't duck the challenge and decides to confront Keith in one of the main lines of the Taimanov variation. And we recall that in an earlier round of the championship, Keith got into trouble against the uh, very improving junior, Alex Golding, after a6 when White took on c6. This time round, he plays the modern refinement, queen c7. Basically, Black doesn't want to play a6 until it's absolutely necessary. In some lines, he might not even play that. White decides to play aggressively, f4. He needs to win, and Black plays a6. White takes on c6. Black takes with the queen. I think taking with either of the pawns here is uh, very passive. I mean, you can just about make a case for b takes c6, but queen takes c6 is more dynamic intending to place the bishop on the long diagonal after b5 and bishop b7. And that's exactly what happens in the game, as white plays bishop d3 and queen e2, and black b5 and bishop b7. And now bishop d2. Another flexible move by which white retains the option of casting on either side. And black plays bishop e7. Okay, well all as seen many times uh, before. Now white goes a3. And an interesting move from Keith, rook to b8. And it's a move which is typical of his style. This sort of move makes him incredibly difficult to beat because he's basically taking some prophylaxis out against against future tactics, protecting his bishop and kind of saying to White, well, if you're going to castle on the queen side, my rook is in the right position to force through b4 at some point. Now, hitherto, there have been some games with... Uh, Rook c8, that's a far more common move than rook b8. It certainly looks more dynamic, but um, results tend to favour white from this position. And I suppose that's because after castles, knight f6, and then a move like g4, white seems to be getting onto the attack. At any rate, he's developed a typical initiative against black's position. Let me just show you one game. Uh, the game... Quisada Perez versus Molina, Montevideo, 20, 2015. The white players, 2645. Black reacted in the centre with d5. White took on d5, black took back with the knight, and now rook h e1. I mean, it may be that this position is fully defensible for black, but it's actually quite difficult because the white attack is much more easy to play. Molina played rook fd8. White played king b1, black played bishop f8, and now f5. The kind of pawn lever that black finds it difficult to fashion in this position. And after e takes f5, bishop takes f5, white was getting a serious initiative. Black took the rook, white recaptured. This is interesting aside because the game doesn't last much longer. And now black decided to take the plunge and go in with queen g2. And when you think about it, it's actually quite difficult to defend uh, h7, given that g6 is answered by queen d4. So queen g2 was played, Quesada Perez took on h7, king h8, and of course after bishop f5, queen takes h2, and now bishop e4, a sudden switch back. Black is completely lost and uh, decided to resign. Too many problems in the position, his bishop's hanging, the rook beyond, rook h1 is a threat, game over. Going back to a3, of course knight f6 is another move which Keith uh, must have considered. That is another main line move. But he sticks with this move, rook to b8, a lesser move in this position, and um, Hawkins decides to castle on the king side. So a small victory for black there. He's persuaded white to castle uh, short. 
But at the same time, Hawkins soon shows that he's got aggressive intentions. So out comes the Black Knight. White pushes on with e5. Knight comes to d5. And now a new move, the first new move in the game, f5. I found that a little surprising, you know, that this is actually a completely new move in this position because um, it's clearly the most aggressive idea in the position. Not only does White go on to the attack, he prevents f5 by black as a defensive resource. For instance, in the only example hitherto from this position, White played knight to e4, and now black played the freeing break f5. Takes, takes, knight g5, castles, and this position should be satisfactory for black. White does have an attack against the king side, but at the same time, black has got some pressure down the long diagonal, which kind of cramps white's style. So Hawkins moves in with f5, and Keith plays knight takes c3. I think that is the correct move. Bishop takes c3. Now, b takes c3, we did consider this in the commentary, I think, but not for very long. It's an unjustified weakening of the pawn formation as white can't really make any real use of the bishop on d2. I think in this particular position, black could take on f5. Rook takes f5, and now cold-bloodedly castle. I mean, I think this is basically an okay position uh, for black. He should be able to defend. And the last thing you want to do against Keith is to give yourself multiple pawn weaknesses, because he's an absolute genius at focusing on these weaknesses. And... Uh, this gives Black the type of game which I'm sure he would enjoy. For instance, if White tries to get rid of one of his weaknesses here, let's say with c4, we could take it, we put our rook on c8, driving the bishop back, we go g6, driving the rook back, and now something like rook c e8. And I would say this is the last type of position you want against Keith. So Hawkins takes back with the bishop, correct, and now another good move by Black, g6. It looks re risky to weaken the dark squares, but um, black should have this all under control. The only thing about the way black was playing was that he was actually using a lot of time on these moves. I mean, basically, black had to win this game. And um, when you're trying to find both two-way moves, really, moves that combine attack and defence, this is really quite difficult. And uh, no wonder, you know, this was costing Keith some time. Anyway, Hawkins opened up the F-file and play bishop b4. That's a good positional exchange from white's point of view, as um, it creates, it highlights these dark square weaknesses on the king side. Nevertheless, black should be okay here, and again, Keith finds a good move. He castles. Rook comes up to f4. Um, now there are ideas of rook h4 with some attack against the king, but all the time, you know, this battery along the long diagonal of queen and bishop is really cramping white's style. So rook bd8 was playable. White played queen f2, and now queen c7, attacking the e-pawn, which Hawkins defends with rook e1. The rook comes up to d5, and now the queen came to e3. Black played queen e7. Well, again, this is uh, good defence by black. Um, he's holding white. White hasn't got a way through just yet, and... All the time, he's got to consider that he's got the worst pawn formation. So White simply committed to keeping the initiative here. Otherwise, Black could find a way of focusing on this pawn at e5. So Rook g4 was played. And now comes a move, I think prompted by time travel, a rather panicky move, h5. I mean, this is probably okay for Black, but loosening the king position when you're very short of time, you know, clearly this makes your defence more difficult. Instead, I think... Black should have just played rook fd8, intending to play h7, h5, only when absolutely necessary. And I'm not actually sure what white has here, how he continues his attack. For instance, if he goes in with queen h6, um, a move designed to intimidate, then rook d4 is a very good defence. Exchanging off the active rook, reminding white about his pawn weaknesses. I mean, I imagine that, that black is actually better in this position. If we go back to rook fd8, what else can white do? Well, he can try rook f4, then rook back to d7. White goes h4. Let's not forget, white's got to press in this position, or his pawns will um, surely become weaker as the game goes on. And now queen f8, a very good move, intended to transfer the queen to h6 or g7 as necessary. If white presses on, we go queen h6. This position is, is unclear. 
And otherwise, I think Black has very good defensive chances here. And uh, might even be a little bit better. So going back once again, Rook F D8. Can White try Rook F1? Well, now Queen C7 hitting the pawn. Rook E1, Queen E7. That was probably the logical way for the game to go. With equality. Of course, that doesn't suit Keith. But uh, maybe that's the best he could do. So going back to the game, h5 was played, white went rook f4, and now Keith played rook fd8. And um, curiously, the situation is different now that black has played this move h5. I mean, what could he do here? Well, I think black should still be in this game. And rook d7 is a good move. That, that holds things together. Or he can play slightly more aggressively with queen g5. And after h4, drop the queen back to h6. The queen's soon going to come to g7, and that will be quite a good square. For instance, if white doubles, the rook comes back, queen f2, queen g7. Black's holding everything, and at the same time, he's hitting the white pawns. So this certainly would, would keep black in the game. Instead, and I should remind everybody, getting very short of time, rook fd8 was played. Hawkins doubled on the f-file. Now queen g5. Queen unpins. And now rook d4 was played, followed by resignation. For some reason, when we were commentating, the, 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 the live boards showed first rook uh, d4, and then after that, rook 5d7. But I have it on good authority that Keith actually played rook d4 and then uh, resigned. Of course, rook 5d7 is a better move than rook, uh, rook d4, and would have challenged white to find a way through. I mean, maybe h4 is best now. Pushing the queen back and now queen to g3 with ongoing pressure. I mean, it's really difficult to defend this position and make correct judgment calls um, when you've got 30 seconds of move for the next 14 moves. But that, I think, would have kept black in the game, at least. Instead, rook d4 was played and um, Keith resigned. It's actually worth pointing out in the final position that, uh, of course, the winning move here is uh, rook takes d4, followed by queen takes f7 check. But... If white plays the plausible rook takes f7 here, then bishop takes g2 is an astonishing resource. And I think that was uh, that was Keith's intention. The point now is that if white takes the bishop, then black has rook to g4. And if white plays a move like queen, uh, let's see, bishop takes g2. If white plays a move like queen to f6, well, there are opportunities for black in this position. But, well, the tension caught up with, uh, with black and uh, rook d4 was followed by resignation. This elevated Jonathan Hawkins to the title of British champion as the other three games on the top four boards were drawn. Congratulations to him and particular congratulations to both players on this excellent competitive last round game.